This week on our Amp America Week in Review, we're digging into the question, are pollsters underestimating Donald Trump's support? Plus, Kamala Harris's team releases an ad that has Remzo and I questioning everything we thought we knew about masculinity. Or does it? And later, Biden's throwing some unexpected curveballs when it comes to the hurricane responses in the Southeast, and you won't believe who's getting the cold shoulder. Brace yourselves for a roller coaster ride through the wild world of American politics. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, happy Saturday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on another fun-filled episode of The Brian Nichols Show. I'm looking at Remzo. He's already backstage. I'm not muted today, so we're starting things off better than we did last week. Folks, looking forward to our Amp America Week in Review. We've got a lot of things to dig into. First, are pollsters actually under-polling Trump support? We got to talk about that, which then leads to Kamala Harris definitely trying to uh, reclaim any voters she can possibly find, which leads to this... I would dare say the worst political ad I've seen in recent memory. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up with Kamala Harris releasing her medical history and records, prompting Trump to do the same, but then raising the question, wait, who's the current guy in the White House right now? Doesn't he have some medical issues? Um, it, it, are the lights on even upstairs? We got to talk about that and more. And again, I already mentioned him. I can't do this alone. Joining me from Amp America, Remzo Martinez. Welcome back to the show, buddy. How you doing? It's the final countdown. Da, 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 da. Great tune. Da, da, da. From Europe, of all bands, by the way. Um, By the way, that note uh, that starts that song off is an F sharp for folks who are playing along the home game. I have a little weird uh, thing called a relative pitch. So when I hear a song and I know what the note is, I will forever be able to hear it. So F sharp, that's what starts the final countdown. There's your trivia for the day, Remzo. We can end the show right there. There you go. That's all you need to know. Harris, Biden, Trump. You don't need to, to know that stuff. We're anyway, know. watching the countdown starts with F right now. It's like Ben Shapiro's wife. <laughs> let's keep going if we're going better than his sister. All right, let's <laughs> talk about. <laughs> I had to just. Grenade <laughs> talk to, to the... <laughs> On that note, um, I have a friend <laughs> that has a whole collection of Ben Shapiro's sister memes. That's all of the thing. <laughs> Oh, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> sister. Um, if you want to end America. sectarian violence in the Middle East, you just got to stop. You just got to start airdropping uh, photos of Ben Shapiro's sister. And then suddenly Hamas would be like, um, you know, I think we misjudge them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they have a point. We they might have two points. Come, come together. together. <laughs> come together. Lots of coming together. Before we get started, Liberty Lovers, mark your calendars for this coming Thursday, October 17th, 9 to 11 p.m. Central. Our good buddies Brian Piotr and the King Libertarian are launching Liberty Tonight. Um, they're bringing a podcast party, I would dare say, Remzo, more explosive than the Boston Tea Party. And with mystery guests and maverick humor, it's the most fun you can have without violating the non-aggression principle. So head to for the number four libertynetwork.com and join the revolution of ridiculousness one more time the number four libertynetwork.com brian piotter and king libertarian on liberty tonight um really excited to have uh, brian piotter and king libertarian helping us out here at the brian nichols show um with that being said though remzo let's transition into today's the gang topic for that the gang sign for, for liberty three. tonight yeah. there you go um trump Trump, it turns out, might be uh, doing better than we realize. Which, by the way, if you look at the polling, Remzo, Trump and Kamala Harris are running dead even. Which, when you go back to 2020, uh, when it was Trump versus Biden, Biden was ahead in a lot of these swing states by four, five, six, seven points. You know, all well above the margin of error. Only two in the election win those within barely of the margin of error. Fast forward four years, we are now in a Trump-Harris uh, campaign where we're seeing Trump running neck and neck with Harris Remzo. That might mean, though, right, that Trump's doing a lot better than the polls actually suggest if we're using 2020 as as a you know historical example here. So talk to us about what's going on over at, um, at the Trump and Harris campaigns and behind the scenes. Is Trump doing better than the polls would say? Oh, goodness, that's the wrong screen here. I'm going to share a different screen. 
it, it, we're, we're dealing with a weird situation. The fact that you have a lot of people compare, comparing to the 2020 numbers in terms of the final uh, month projections, which, as you mentioned, did go ahead and show Biden from anywhere from a two to six point lead in most battleground states. Um, Trump led Georgia by like half a percent up until election night. And then as the mail in ballots came in, um, he went ahead and would lose Georgia in 2020. But when people compare this to 2016, um, up until this point, Trump was leading in Arizona and Georgia and North Carolina by a smidge, but Hillary was projected to have this massive plus 270 uh, electoral college blowout. I remember I was working uh, the campaign for a guy who was a state senator. Um, he would later become a congressman. His name was Tom Garrett in the 5th District of Virginia. 5th and 6th yeah. District of Virginia were big red counties, but they had, um, you know, they, they were winning by less of a margin than they had historically uh, post Bush era. So as we were running phone banks and we were trying to do our own internal polling of, you know, uh, low propensity voters, independents, uh, folks that you know had just recently registered to vote for the general election in 2016. What we saw, and this is when Trump was like, you know, for the most part, you have really two camps of people. You had the people, well, he had three camps. You had the people like me who were brainwashed by the media and we just hated Trump for the sake of it. Then you had the people who like, didn't necessarily pay attention to any of the things I was paying attention to. And they just had this obsessive like love for Trump that just no one understood why they were so optimistic because all the numbers were showing that he was not supposed to win, but they mm -hmm. knew somewhere in like their gut and their balls that he was going to win. And I, to this day, I don't understand what they saw that I didn't. It'll always be a mystery to me. And then you've got this. Hey folks, I want to take a moment to talk about something that has truly changed my life. And that is, Cardio Miracle, our incredible studio sponsor. Now, I'll be honest, when I first heard about Cardio Miracle and their claims about improving heart health, I was skeptical. But after using it for just about two months, I was absolutely blown away by the results. First, my blood pressure went from being consistently around 140 over 90 to a much more healthier and manageable 120 over 80. And my resting heart rate dropped from the low 70s to the high 50s and I couldn't believe it. But the benefits didn't stop there. I started sleeping better, and I felt more energized at the gym, and my heart felt the best it's felt in years. And it's not just me. Hundreds of you, our amazing listeners, have reached out to share your own incredible experiences with Cardio Miracle. So what is Cardio Miracle, and how does it work? It's a carefully crafted supplement that harnesses the power of nitric oxide to support optimal heart function. So by increasing nitric oxide levels in your blood, Cardio Miracle helps relax your blood vessels, improve circulation, and it protects your heart from damage. It's like giving your heart the support it needs to function at its best. And here's the best part. We've got an exclusive offer just for you, our loyal listeners here at The Brian Nichols Show. When you head over to CardioMiracle.com and use code TBNS at checkout, you'll get an extra 15% discount on your order. Plus, with their 100% money back guarantee, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So, if you're ready to take control of your heart health and experience the life changing benefits of Cardio Miracle for yourself, just click the link in the show notes or video description. Trust me, your heart will thank you. And don't wait another day to prioritize your health. Join the tens of thousands of folks who have already discovered the Cardio Miracle difference. Head to CardioMiracle.com now and use code TBNS for 15% off your order. Your journey to a happier and healthier heart starts today. And now, let's get back to the show. Second camp of people who were like a lot of staffers who were like, yeah, you know, we want Republicans to win. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's our guy and we care less about Trump. We just care about our guy. So we were going and we were polling people across our district. And for the most part, at least when I was running the phone banks, we had a lot of people, a lot of, you know, soft R or hard R Republican voters that were absolutely going to go ahead and vote. You're for, not supposed to use the hard R anymore. Rem I thought it was going to be soft R. Um, <laughs> we're thinking two different things. Uh, uh -huh. I don't even know what I was going to say. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, now I remember. Now I remember. Um, 
we had a lot of people that were going to vote for my guy, Tom Garrett. However, we had a lot of folks who said, I am unequivocally not voting for Trump. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they were voting for Hillary. It just meant they were not voting for Trump. Mm-hmm. Well, so you have you have that group of people. They're going to vote down ticket R, but they're not going to vote Trump. Then what you had. And remember, we're, we're not we're not we're not phone banking Democrats. We just need to guarantee a Republican vote. Um, you had a lot of people who on our systems were, you know, were Republicans, had voted Republican, but they didn't want to talk to us. We could safely assume that they're going to go ahead and vote, um, you know, de- cross ballot Republican, Trump included. The number of people who I, we recognize as Republicans but would not speak to us outnumber the number of people that were going to vote down ballot Republican, but we're not going that we're going to abstain from voting for Trump. That's that silent Trump voter. It was that massive number of people who I identified as Republicans but refused to participate in polling, which is why back when we only had elections for like a day at least, um, Trump had such a massive blowout on election day. And it was you know, like within two hours of polls closing that he had 95 percent certainty of winning the Electoral College. So fast forward to 2020. It's a different situation. I think a lot of people abstained and, you know, being in a battleground state of Wisconsin, I know quite a few people that voted for Trump in 2016, but they voted for Biden in 2020 because it's not that they loved Biden. It's that, every, you know, they, they fell for four years of media bullshit and then they dealt with the COVID and the pandemic and everything else. And they just thought that maybe Black Lives Matter will stop burning down targets if we put the old dementia man in the white house. They did it not because they liked Biden. They did it because they just thought maybe it'll stop. And now those people are in a weird position where they don't know, like they don't know why they got bamboozled. I could tell you why it's because the massive media gaslighting, but I know more of those people who are 2016 Trump voters. And and this goes back even further. And I'm about to wrap up in a second there. This is the unique voter. It's called the Obama Trump voter. Obama, Obama, 08, Obama, 2012, Trump, 2016, Biden or split Trump, 2020, almost all those people I know, at least in my immediate circle. So just take one man's opinion for it. A humble Milwaukeean. um, They're going back for Trump, Mm -hmm. but they're not going to say it. So I think right now we're, what we're going to witness is that the enthusiasm for Trump is way more across the battleground states specifically. You just have a lot of people who don't want to interact with the pollsters. And I believe that they're going to go ahead and cast a ballot for Trump in advance. So that's where we're at right now. I think the internal pollings tell you more than anything else because Trump is confident. Trump is doing his thing while Kamala is appealing towards hunters, towards men, towards white people, three people that they said they did not need. They're trying really hard to get corral with the union vote, which you didn't think that they would have to spend ads for. I'm seeing ads targeted towards union members. Um, encouraging them to vote Democrat. And it's like, why would you ever have to do those unless you were worried that they were pulling away from you? And as you and I discussed in September, um, you know, the Teamsters went ahead and they were split and they refused to endorse the yep. bunch of uh, Teamster councils across the country went ahead and endorsed Harris. But that only reflects the will of like maybe a dozen people. It, the the downline Teamster union card carrying member is overwhelmingly 60% across the board going to vote for Trump. So when you look at that, and when you look at another story that we're going to talk about later, you can tell on your gut when they have to, what what do you say, Brian, when you're explaining you're losing? Bingo. When you're explaining you're losing. Bingo. No, a thousand percent, man. And we're going to show, by the way, you mentioned some of these ads that the Kamala Harris campaign is trying to leverage to appeal to white voters. We're going to look at that in a second because I think it might be one of the worst ads I've ever seen. Um, But also, I just want to rewind to something you mentioned, these kind of like um, tacitly accepted voters for the Democratic Party, right? The, 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 The safe voters are no longer safe. You're seeing Barack Obama come out right now being like, hey, they're black men. Uh, you need to go vote for our girl Kamala. You know, it's not it's not cool. You go vote for the Donald Trump guy. He's you got a good economy. That was my economy. Like that is them saying the quiet part out loud, right? 
internal polling not looking so good. And when you do the man on the street interviews and you see, I mean, even folks like Don Lemon, uh, Don Lemon uh, go out to uh, places like Atlantic City, which is not really, I mean, a Trump haven, but he's in Atlantic City asking folks, hey, who are you voting for? And when he's talking to, to black men, he's getting a lot of Trumps and he's like kind of deer in the headlights look. And it's like, well, Don, maybe you need to get out of your bubble. Maybe you need to actually look at and talk to your average person, not with trying to persuade them or convince them, but actually understand them. Know why they, they are not jumping for joy at the prospects of voting for a Kamala Harris presidency. And, you know, before we go to our next ad, I, I really quickly, Remzo, um, I want to just highlight one more thing. And that is where we're heading right now into 2024 and beyond. There is a realignment happening. Um, it's it's happening behind the scenes. It's been happening now, I think, for the past like eight years. 2016 gave a lot of folks permission to, to step away from the Democratic Party and start evaluating options. 2020, to your point, was kind of a reversion to the mean. But I think we're seeing right now, 2024, the realignment is really starting to, to, to show itself where you have more of a working class American voter going back to the Republican Party versus the decades, generations of supporting Democrat leadership. And, and with that, on the flip side, a lot of college educated, dare I say, college educated white chicks are now the party of the Democratic Party, right? That That is more or less who comprises that base. So you've seen a very interesting realignment over the past few years um, and really starting to show itself over you know the past few months, I think, especially, especially with the Kamala Harris um, taking over the ticket versus uh, Donald Trump. So um, before we go yeah, to really our, our- Controversial take, I'll just say real fast. Yeah, yeah, I'm only the- saying this because a woman told this to me. I was like, why is it these women who are as educated or as workforce experienced as most men are, why do they break for Democrats? And a female friend told me, because at the end of the day, for a woman, for a woman, the best welfare program, the best fallback program for a woman is a man. With that being said, Brian, what do you have for your coffee today? I, I How's your grabbing, coffee, Brian? What's in here? This fun student, not systems coffee cup. Well, maybe it's from our brand new sponsor, Clock'em Craft Coffee. Let's take a listen. Are you sick of bland, bitter coffee that relies on sugar and cream just to be drinkable? You deserve better. Most coffees are over-roasted, destroying subtle flavors and leaving you with a burnt taste in your mouth. That's where Clock'em Craft Coffee is different. Their carefully crafted roasts preserve every nuance from chocolatey notes to fruity hints. Rediscover what coffee should taste like. Choose Clock'em Craft and wake up to flavor, not frustration. And by the way, Brian Eagle Show listeners, get 10% off your order using code BNS10 at clock'emcraft.coffee. Link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. All right, Remzo. So we're going to go. Oh, maybe if I get rid of the uh, ad here. There we go. But it's great coffee, by yeah, the way. Uh, Folks I are always asking me about the coffee. Second cup. You're on your second cup today? No, I, I feel like this is going to be a second cup type of day. I've got, oh, some, yeah, no. I've got something funny because I'm, I'm going to need a second cup. Brian, you remember I used to do a ghost hunting show? <laughs> yeah, with your brother. That's right. Good times. Yes. I am for the first time tonight. I promise this will be the only plug I give. Um, I, I work, uh, I work with a local barber shop called the barber social. It's a men's boutique barber shop here in, uh, in Milwaukee County. And, uh, they're fun. We treat it like a reality TV show. They're on Instagram at the barber social. It's just hilarious. And they, they've been selling me for years cause I was getting my haircut there for years as a customer before I became their marketer. But, um, weird stuff has happened in that building. So tonight, tonight, uh, from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m., we're going to be investigating whether or not the barber shop is haunted. Dude, I'm gonna have to have you come down back to, uh, to Indiana here because so here, here. By the way, we're live, folks. For folks who are wondering, guys, I saw a couple chats come in. Yes, we are live. This is not pre-recorded, so you are you are joining us live here on a Saturday morning. Thanks for hopping in. But I'm I'm here in in Indiana. Our studio um, space. So I share a studio space with our neighbors next door, the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast. So literally, I just walk through a little door. I'm in their podcast studio. This building itself used to be an ice cream parlor. So you go down into the basement and you'll see like all the, yeah, the, all the old stuff that's down in the basement that used to help make it. So, you know, you could go and have like refrigeration back in like the, the early 1900s, mid 1900s, like super, I mean, like it, it's like, it, like steam powered stuff downstairs. It's really cool. Um, but I've been in here early, early morning. Like I'll, I'll start my day sometimes three 30, four o'clock just to get things done before my daughter wakes up. 
and I'll be in here and I'll hear some stuff. Like I'll, I'll hear like, you know, people making noises and stuff. But I know the girl that's the resident upstairs. I know she's fast asleep um, or she's not even here. And I'll just hear like, you know, people like stepping like footsteps, walking through the, the studio. So next time you're in Indiana, um, give me a shout because we're going to do some ghost, some ghost stuffs here in the, the podcast studio. <laughs> Sound like a plan? Hell yeah. All right, there you go. First time doing it in four years. It's so funny because online I have like this whole subculture of people who don't know me for any of this stuff. They only know me as Remso, the guy that used to lock himself in like the murder bathroom or like the murder bedroom or like the suicide jacuzzi or something like that. Just it's so- like our buddy Aiden Mattis. He he did politics stuff for a long, long time. Then he goes over and he starts his podcast or his YouTube channel, The Lore Lodge. And dude, millions of like subscribers and that's his world now but like he's got a whole political world that he used to be part of um and it, when he was on last time for conspiracy corner we had a chat just like can you can you just imagine you know aiden when we were you know, hanging out together at the libertarian republic days back in 2016 that you'd be doing this i'd be doing this remzo's doing this it's just life's funny that's funny all right let's look that's, at the uh, worst yeah, off on a tangent it's halloween month i have to go ahead and talk about people don't even know like people are like how hardcore are you i'm gonna show up for the first time do it not a tattoo of a of a freaking ghost look at that how hardcore are you i'm like I, i'm inked motherfucker it's <laughs> oh shit if i could right. if i could be a millionaire overnight and do anything it would be traveling to haunted places that would be my only that would be my life there's our there's our mission. Get Remzo <laughs> on the road being a, a professional ghost hunter. Um, yeah, and 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 hey, if things aren't working out, Remzo, you can just go ahead and be an extra in the ad from which we are going to go ahead and watch now. Which okay, yeah, I see Remzo. He is gagging. Um, folks joining us along uh, right now live on on Twitter and on Facebook. Please, if you're having your morning breakfast, if you're having your morning coffee, just take a moment, pause. Hi, as you Joe watch kids. this ad. Hi, Joe wife. Now, by the way, gentlemen, as you're listening to this, I want you to go into the comments and let us know, does this ad appeal to you? That's all I'm going to ask. And let's go ahead and take a listen. I'm a man. I'm a man. I'm a man, man. And I'm man enough. I'm man enough to enjoy a barrel proof bourbon. Neat. Man enough to cook my steak rare. Man enough to deadlift 500 then braid the out of my daughter's hair. You think I'm afraid to rebuild a carburetor? I eat carburetors for breakfast. I ain't afraid of bears. That's what bear hugs are for. I'll tell you another thing I sure as shit am not afraid of. Women. I'm not afraid of women. I'm not afraid of women. They want to control their bodies? I say go for it. They want to use IVF to start a family? I'm not afraid of families. They want to be childless cat ladies? Have all the cats you want. Woman wants to be president? Well, I hope she has the guts to look me right in the eye and accept my full-throated endorsement. Because I'm man enough to support women. Man enough to know what kind of donuts I like. Man enough to admit I'm lost even when I refuse to ask for direction. Man enough to not ban young women from reading little. Or one of those pants books that the sisters like. I'm man enough to raw dog a flight. It sucked. Not worth it. I'm man enough to be emotional in front of my wife. In front of my kids. In front of my horse. I'm man enough to tell you that I cry at love action. Goodwill hunting. West Side Story. That and pray. And I'm sick of so-called men domineering, belittling, and controlling women just so they can feel more powerful. That's not how my mama raised me. I love women. I love women who support their families. Women who decide not to have families. Women who take charge. And I'm man enough to help them win. Oh, man. All right. Hold on, Remzo. So really quick, I just need to go back to... uh... There he is. This this gem. Kind of donuts I like. Man enough to admit I'm lost even when I refuse. This this, this gen uh, right here. If this man does not scream the embodiment of masculinity while Remzo. <laughs> and by the way, whoever wrote this fucking script deserves an Emmy because I think they must have been trying to be hilarious behind the scenes because SNL could not have who, crafted a better skit. Who gives the quite obviously gay actor who is sitting very feminine. Like, I mean, I'm sorry. Like how else do you describe this guy? And then say, Hey, by the way, when you're saying you're voting for Kamala Harris, don't just say you're voting for her. Tell them you're giving all your full, your, your full throated endorsement, full throated. Uh, I mean, uh, Remzo, this ad beyond being horrible. Um, it screams desperation. It screams 
we're fucked with normal guys. That's how I read it. Am I off base? I, I sent you a, I, I sent you a YouTube link. I don't know if we okay. can pull that up, but like, I, I saw this and I, I've been saying this very deliberately. The f- energy of the Harris campaign is off the charts because it's just like the most neutered, castrated type of stuff. And I, I, are, we, are we showing this clip really quick, by yeah, the way? Let's show, let's show this clip because this is what, when I saw this ad, this is a video that I remember it started circulating again because they were like, when is this guy going to go, you know, jump for Tim walls and talk to us about masculinity. Play this one, please. It's vaccination day. It's vaccination day. It's vaccination day. Appointments are open. I'm group four. I don't have to stay here anymore. I'm sick of eating takeout on these plates. The time indoors has got me stressed, but I just checked on CVS. Finally, they're giving me some dates. I'll see actual real life people. It'll be totally strange. I might even get to go see a game. For the first time in forever, I'll hang out with someone else. Love you. But for the first time in forever, I won't watch sports by myself. Because you don't like sports, you know. I could go to a so, like. The, the, the energy here is just, I get mad watching this. This actually, and the rest of it is just as horrible. I get so, way, just, 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 so just two violently things them, angry. Two things. First of all, the, the, the theater self of me, because I was in theater. Like I, I Trust me. I was the, the weird guy because I was also the gym bro who played football, but also was in theater. So like me and the theater nerds didn't exactly get along. As a matter of fact, the theater ne- nerds used to look at me and be like, I really wish that you would take this seriously. And then I'd be like, watch this as I hit every note perfectly. Um, This guy's voice is actually really, really good, which breaks my heart because then you add in the energy you're talking about. (laughs) Plus, plus, first of all, I, I, no, God damn it. I got to even fucking do this. I have horrible ADHD, right? And I've been able to um, like actually figure out the best ways to utilize ADHD for me to be successful. I read a great book called, um, I I didn't write it. I read a book called it all makes sense now which i've been sending to a lot of folks but like just to be like adhd is awesome it breaks my heart because i'm like god damn it why is this the gay version of me (laughs) (laughs) so so that's where i'm at today he's using his powers for evil (laughs) like if you got a nice voice i mean come on like use your powers for good not just for making people feel that they need to go to CVS and get their 14th booster. Come on. Yeah. I, I bring this up because like, this is like the Doug M Hoff, Tim walls thing where it's just like puppy dog energy, gay yeah, it, puppy dog energy. It's, it's like, they're playing like man bingo. It's like, what do men like? It's like <laughs> chicken wings, guns, trucks. And then they're just like, but you know what I really love abortion. <laughs> it's like, this is nobody just- talks like this. This is ch- if chat GPT created an ad. Yes, this would be it. But <laughs> I mean, it's like, who does Trump have in his corner? I don't know. Um, Connor McGregor, the entire Miami Dolphins football entire, team. Yeah. Like, you know, like you look at the dudes like Hulk Hogan, Kid Rock, like, and you know, you can, you can laugh at that to a degree, but it's like all the guys who in popular culture are seen as our dudes are dudes dudes i'm not gonna say like you know high network you know high worth i mean shit man back in 2016 God. tom brady was getting shit because he had to make america great a hat in his, his locker and like tom brady is the winningest quarterback love him or hate him oh. in nfl history like the dudes got it figured out like like actual guys yes. dudes dudes like men who yes. it's like whether we agree with them or not like we respect their opinion it's like they couldn't even get like straight men to pretend to be straight men in this, you know, would be a more effective ad than, than a bunch of these, these goofballs, right? Have an ad of someone like Mark Cuban. Like I, there's a lot I disagree with Mark Cuban on, but like at least you want to put Mark Cuban on TV more. (laughs) Probably not. He's been doing, but, but hear me out. Remzo, right? Like if you take your average Midwestern dude and you were to show him this ad that we just watched with, with all the, the fun fellas there um, versus if it was Mark Cuban, who they, probably know from shark tank they're like hey he used to own the mavericks he's still a co-owner of the mavericks right like 
He's a sports guy. He's got the persona of being a dude. He's a billionaire. Like, which ad would have more of an impact in actually getting somebody to pique their interest and pay attention to what they're saying? I'm just going to tell you right now, no doubt Mark Cuban will have way more of an impact in an advertisement than a bunch of these, these fairies. And at the end of the day, this is not this is not me like criticizing the people. It's the fact that the, the Kamala Harris campaign thought that this is what your average dude needed to hear in order to jump on board the Harris campaign. And it just energy is not targeting any specific group of people. Anyone can be a, everyone can be a, is a choice. So when I say the energy is off the charts, I'm talking about like neutered people who take these bumper sticker ideologies and these men who just forego any independent thought because they're going with the DEI woke mind virus. Beat like, pop, boop. It's, yeah, it's the, all the NPC that. mentality. Yeah, I mean, Zachary Levi is a yes. theater kid, but he is a- Shazam, dog. by the way, folks, playing along the home game. He's the guy who was the main actor for Shazam. Yeah, like Zachary Levi has gotten so much shit. But like, yes. when you, here's the thing, and, and Zachary Levi voted for Biden in 2020 mm -hmm. when Zachary Levi is like, I can't have anything to do with this stuff. And he's flamboyant and he's funny and all that stuff. Like when you're losing those guys, it's like, are, are you, I, I want, I want someone to say that Zachary Levi is toxically masculine. Do it. Yeah. hundred percent. I want them to, I want them to do that. Yeah. You know, it's one of the reasons why a lot of guys liked RFK when he was running against Trump. Because yes. RFK, you know, while while he definitely had like his liberal streak with some of the environmental stuff and things like that and guns, like they looked at him, they're like, this is a bro's bro. It, there's something that's okay. <sighs> Sorry, Chase. I had a man crush on RFK. Like everyone like, God knows that. But let, let's let's talk about this, Remzo, because this is where libertarians miss the, the mark, right? I just did an episode of Brian's briefing Speaking of talking fact, about energy. this. Stop. Oh man, you're going to get some trouble. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get some trouble, but like the, the whole weirdo mentality, right. Of like embracing weirdness for the sake of it being weird. That is not a, a, a campaign strategy. It's not a value proposition. Right. And let's just break it down as black and white as possible. Cause I heard a lot of libertarians freaking out. Like why is RFK getting all this support? Cause he just feels authentic. He just feels real. Chase feels contrived. Chase feels like calculated and, and like manipulative. Like, how can I present myself in such a way that gets this, you know, this subset of people to like me? How can I, you know, talk about things that are, are not going to be appealing to certain folks, but maybe to this little tiny subsection, whereas RFK is like, this is who I am for better or for worse. You, you love some of the things I do. You hate some of the things I do. You know where I stand and I'm just going to be upfront and honest with you. RFK at least presents himself as a normal, authentic person. That doesn't change the fact that, yeah, he supported the Green New Deal. He's been you know, a big proponent of gun control. Like, yeah, there's a red flags across the board. But when it comes to do you get the moment where we are right now, not just as a country, but as a, a world, as a planet, as a, like a, a big population, a community of the earth, like we are in a really big tipping point. And I just feel that there's the status quo, folks like the Chase Olivers of the world who they're again, this squishy moderate, you know, just trying to appeal to the weakest and, and most beta amongst us versus like dudes being dudes. Where has that gone? Where has that like the acceptance of that is just a re like dudes need to be dudes. We need to be able to talk like dudes, to interact like dudes with other dudes like Remzo. And, and we didn't even, prepare to talk about this but like what do you see as kind of that split between the dude's dude um versus the way that the kamala harris campaign frames the dudes the way that chase oliver's campaign frames going after dudes like is it is it just again pardon the expression but is it that 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 energy is it well, something like I that where I like this this theater mentality has carried over into their outreach and i think i need to defend energy in terms Friends of against government for folks playing along the home game. So do you know, do you know, I'm going to point out two individuals that come to mind in terms yes. of a dude's dude, because I know I'm going to get the people in the comments who are like, he said something anti-gay John Hospers. Do you know who John Hospers is? John, you should know this. John Hospers yes. was the libertarian party presidential candidate in 1972. John Hospers. Oh, oh yeah. And then, and then we ran the chick, right? As the VP. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're, know, we're, that we're, we're, that was, and, and you want to talk about a ticket that's wild, right? In the seventies, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh, an openly gay man running alongside a woman in nineteen seventy-two. John Hosper, unheard of. Yeah, John Hosper's. Um, from ever, I mean, I never met him because he died in two thousand eleven, way before I started paying attention to stuff. But I know enough people who did. Like John Hospers was a guy's guy, and he did a lot for the Libertarian Party. And even though he was openly gay when he was running for president, um, he focused on the economy. He focused on wars. He focused on civil liberties. It became a thing where it's like that's a part of me, but that's not yes. all of me. And I, I point out him because John Hospers, when you look at his life and you look at his contributions to the liberty movement, that's a man that libertarians, that, uh, that's a man that Americans, anyone that wants to live the American dream and do good for people, John Hospers is a man that deserves everyone's respect. And, and really quick, just really quick, this, by the way, is where I, I see Chase's campaign do this a lot. They're like, why do people, the first thing they point out is that he's a gay guy. It must be because they're homophobic. No, it's because when Chase presents himself on, on camera, the first thing he leads with is like, I'm a gay man running as, that's why, because you make that the focus. You make that the priority versus exactly what you just outlined. That's a part of you, sure, but uh, John Hosberger, is that what you said his name is? John Hospers. Yep, John Hosper, it's like he didn't make that a part of the campaign. It was a part of him, but he didn't lead with that because at the end of the day, that's not what people care about. I mean, sure, it's great that you're that. Okay, fine. What are you, what's in it for me, right? We talk about this in business, the WIFM statement, W-I-I-F-M. What is in it for me? You being gay does not tell me anything about how you're going to help cut my taxes, how you're going to help make my life better, how you're going to help get government out of the way. Like, yes, Chase talks about those things, but when you lead with the who I am first versus the what I'm going to lead with for solutions, people tune out because that's the first thing they hear. And back to this whole ad we watched, right? Then that becomes the, okay, that's who you are. All right. It's understand. Not about, it's not about who you love or what your preferences are. It's about how you act yes. and how you treat others and your view of yourself in the world. And I mean, Rob Smith from Turning Point USA, you know, like 6'3", 200 something muscular black dude, U.S. Army veteran. So, you know, go army on that end. Um, you know, conservative has led the, you know, part of that that movement of like, you know, log cabin Republicans and stuff like that. It's like, listen, like we're men who happen to be gay, but we live our lives and you know, we we can't just focus on this. It's like, I look at that and it's like, you know, I want to say it again. Energy has nothing to do with what people will say it is. It's all about how they act and the energy in that commercial that Harris put out the energy in the COVID thing. And we see it all the time. Like the white dudes for Harris. It's like, those aren't dudes, especially like, let's look right now. Do you want one of those guys saving you from hurricane floodwaters? Or do you want an actual dude? Did you, did you see the meme? So you remember the meme of it's all the, the, like I say something mean about Trump, the comment section looks like, and then it's like the grid of all these like boomer dudes wearing the make America great hats. And they got the big beards. I saw the exact meme and it's like when there's a hurricane and your town's underwater, these are the folks coming to save you. And it's the exact same picture because that's exactly it, Remzo, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want the the theater dudes singing um, the, the vaccination song that's that's to the tune of Frozen. You don't want the dude sitting with his, his arm all positioned properly telling you he's deep throating it for Kamala, right? What we need is, is like real dudes talking to real dudes and and I, again i go I back to as a man who has memorized the entire soundtrack to the greatest showman oh that's like the best so that's good the, it's so come, good come alive is one of my bops dude if i ever need to get some energy going listen to some come alive hugh jackman you can't go wrong there i swear to god this that's is this laugh. is my theater side coming out man you, yeah. you you hit me the the yeah the the easy part but you right, see, um, there's, there's there's liking like those more like you know creative things and then there's just what we've witnessed which is just yes. dangerous amounts of energy so that's my ideology when i explain what energy is it's a mindset it's not anything else it's fag energy and we have to call it out for what it is we're gonna get so many Please fun don't put letters this in the title 
Yeah, no, no, don't worry. I, I want to make sure this video stays on YouTube. Um, so if you're listening to this episode and you're like, wow, Remzo and Brian are really dancing on the edge here. Um, they, gotta, they better be careful. Don't worry. We have insurance. And with that, let's talk about our brand new sponsor. Paul. Hey, everyone. Let's talk about the elephant in everybody's room. Insurance. Does all that insurance jargon make your head spin? If so, you're not alone. It's tough to make smart decisions about your family's protection when it all sounds like gobbledygook. Well, I recently discovered a company that's changing the insurance game, and that company is called Policy Engineer. These folks are on a mission to make insurance understandable for everyone. They offer free educational webinars, personalized consultations, and easy to digest resources to help you become an insurance pro. Here's their approach. They explain, you decide. They'll walk you through your options, answer all of your questions, and empower you to make confident choices about your family's future. Because when you understand your coverage, you can rest easy knowing you made the right decision all along. Ready to take control of your insurance? Head over to policyengineer.com and start your journey to becoming an informed, empowered policyholder. And of course, don't forget to tell them the Brian Nichols Show sent you. Policy Engineer, redefining insurance one member at a time. And now, let's get back to the show. September, by the way, because it was Life Insurance uh, Awareness Month, something like that. Uh, so go ahead and check out Policy Engineer. And again, make sure you let them know that Brian Nichols sent you. And by the way, Remzo, yes, I am, if anything, a professional. That's what we call a segue in the industry, which, by the way, speaking of which... <laughs> Uh, rumor is medical history has been released because, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, your health insurance. And let's talk about the health. See that, Remzo? That's called a transition. The health of the two leading candidates here for both the Republicans and the Democrats. Harris, uh, Kamala Harris's campaign has released her medical history. Uh, and a lot of folks saying, well, now it's going to force Trump to do the same. But Remzo, I don't know. I'm just saying this out loud. Um, who's the current president of the United States? Is that something that we should be concerned about? The people who told you that Biden can ride a bike, the people that told you up until the day she died that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was doing CrossFit, the people that told you that that uh, old senator lady from California, Diane Diane Feinstein, was you know just at the top of her game as she went to go cast her last vote that she had no clue anything about and then she she thought she already voted for yeah and (laughs) then they pushed her back into the corner and died Mm -hmm. the people who told you that john fetterman was the ideal peak cognitive person ever because none of those words made sense Uh, the eagles they're, they're suddenly looking at donald trump and saying well he's too old he's not fit enough it's like i'm sorry this is as we were, were talking about in the first segment this is another plea it's like oh you, they they're trying now that they've tried everything they have to go to like the top of the stack so first it was you know make sure that he can't run again then it was make sure he can't get on the ballots then it was bankrupt him then it was uh, sue him into oblivion. Then it was try and put him in jail. Then it was try and kill him. Then it was try and kill him again. Then it was try and force him into as many debates as possible. Then it was, um, you know, try and have Iran shoot down his jet. And now that they've gone through everything possible and he is leading everywhere, they have to start from the top of the stack again and say, well, he's old. <laughs> oh, it's well, like now, now that's, a, that's an argument they can try to use because they couldn't use that up until mid July, right? Because saw, if they knew that, Trump. it was also a critique of Biden. Yeah, I saw Trump do like three hours of Andrew Schultz's podcast. Which what a what a sit down that was. It's just, it was just like the most recent one. He does he does like five interviews a day. Yep, and Kamala has done like less than 20 since becoming the nominee and she can't do a town hall without a teleprompter. Like <laughs> really start telling like just just tell me that you've lost the you've lost the game. You don't know what you're doing. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. And inside inside Kamala's own team, they're already telling her that she's going to have the worst electoral turnout in modern history. Yep. 
So the fact that we're seeing this now, it's like they, they, they don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. They're afraid. It's afraid. I say it's being the machine, right? The machine is afraid uh, because they, they, and I was just listening to this podcast earlier. Um, they were talking about how the, the arguments about Trump's age, when you look at the current president in the United States, why are they not carrying over to the guy who's going to be president for at least the next two and a half months? Like he's not running for president because his brain was so broken, he couldn't get through an hour and a half, two hour long debate with Donald Trump. So the fact that he is still the sitting president of the United States, and now the Democrats are trying to leverage this argument that Trump's too old. Okay, let's here. I'll see your Trump's too old and I'll raise you a, what does that make Biden then? Because if you're going to simultaneously, Democrats, argue that Trump is too old, therefore he cannot be uh, running for president of the United States because he's going to be senile, then that requires you right now to be logically consistent, if that's the case, which we know they're not. But if you were logically consistent, then you would say 25th Amendment time because Biden obviously is not running the show. And, and I go back to it's scared. The folks behind the scenes, the deep state, which does exist. I think we all acknowledge that now that they, they've said they exist. There was a whole article written after 2020 about the deep state and how they were able to help get Trump out of office. Uh, when you look at that, they like the fact that there's no head of state because that means they're the heads of state. They're the puppet masters. They get to control what's actually happening from a policy perspective. And they're the ones steering the ship, not the guy who's supposed to be the front runner, which Remzo speaks to exactly why they want Kamala Harris to, to win. Because Dude, all I, she be is another copy and paste of Biden, not from the faculty standpoint, but from the puppet standpoint. She will say and do whatever she needs to to keep that deep state apparatus happy. Because as we saw back in 2020, every position... Every fucking position she had leading up to that election has completely turned on a dime. She no longer supports Medicare for all. She no longer supports the Green New Deal. She no longer supports open borders. Why? What changed, Kamala? I went across America and I talked to everyone. I grew up in a middle class family. <laughs> I grew up in the middle class family. I heard uh, the hopes, the dreams, the ambitions, the aspirations of America. No, Kamala, I'm sorry. It's because you are completely malleable to whoever is pulling the strings. That's the truth. Um, I think my, I, I've, I, I don't think I'd ever say this about Joe Biden, but like my favorite era of Biden is like right now. Cause Biden is like, so gangster. He does not get stuff. a shoot the stuff, the stuff he is throwing. Like, I love reading like the liberal magazines that are talking about like the open warfare between Biden's team and Harris's team. They hate each other, dude. They, they hate each other. I, I just want him. I like, you know, I thought the MAGA hat thing was genuinely a joke. I don't think there was anything subliminal about it, but how he's, re how he's responded regarding the hurricane stuff. Yes. There we go. Everything. Yeah. The Tell, tell a story about um, DeSantis, by the way. she Kamala Harris called him. He didn't take her she's, phone she's calls. Trying, yeah, she's trying right now to make it appear as if she's the sitting U.S. president. She's trying to do it that way. Yep. And, um, you know, she's not really going anywhere. The places she's going are like super photo ops. And then she tried to go ahead and have a phone call with uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And he's like, why am I talking to her? She's a political candidate. She's not the president. She's trying what she wanted to do. I think you and I have talked about this at some point. She's trying to pull a Hurricane Sandy, a yes. la Christy yep. Obama 2012. I think we talked about that last week. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's the exact was, same playbook. Yeah, the story was in 2012, there were two moments in which my father, the, the, the middle class, I don't pay attention, Oracle of all elections, said that Obama was going to win. One, it was when Biden completely destroyed Paul Ryan mm -hmm. in the VP debate. And second was when Christie went ahead and basically open mouth tongue kissed Obama during yep. the Hurricane Sandy. Big old bear hug. That's right. And she is, she's trying to do that. And so Santos is just like, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. I don't need to take her call. I'm busy trying to save lives. And somebody tried to bring up that to Biden and Biden and DeSantis have sparred a lot, but notice what he said. It was like Tuesday. I think mm -hmm. he went ahead and said, uh, when somebody was like, you think it's wrong that she's not, that, uh, he's not responding to uh, vice president Harris's call. He didn't, he didn't answer that. What he said was he and I have been speaking regularly and he knows that he can get all the resources and support that he needs. 
and he's doing to paraphrase. He's like, he's doing the best he can and he will get from me whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And it was in that moment where everyone on liberal Twitter, my wife showed me this. She's, she's like, my wife is like embedded liberal TikTok, And it's so funny. It's so funny because don't always have conservatives or libertarians tell you how the left is thinking. Just go to the left where the They'll left hangs out. And they're Which, like, by the way, that's what they hate lives of TikTok because she just says, look. <laughs> yeah. They, they are panicking. They're like the comments on one of the screenshots she showed me of this one video of, of Biden not helping Kamala's cause at all was like, is he trying to throw her under the bus? And then another one was like, he gives no shits anymore. It's like, why should he? Why should he? Joe Biden is a lot of things. The one thing that no one can say about him, and this is almost like a Rubio line from 2016 where he was talking about Obama. It's like people act like Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. I say the same thing about Biden, even with all of his cognitive ability gone. He might there might not be a lot going up on there, but he knows exactly what he's doing. Joe Biden is and never has been a stupid man. Dude, you and don't that, go in, in the U.S. Senate for forty plus years being a stupid. Oh, he is. He is yeah, I, might, I might eat my words because we got you know Diane yeah. Feinstein and all that. So he is like the most like cr he is the most criminal president we've ever had. The most criminal president we've mm -hmm. ever had. But he's not stupid. No. So with him doing this, he knows exactly what he's doing, and I'm here for every second of it. Which is why also to kind of derail it off the other end. I also think that libertarian party members are psyoped hmm. because all this, you know, we're already seeing early voting. It's like, you know, you're, you're just falling for the shit. You know, I'm not, I won't bring up the energy again, but it's like, I've gone ahead and said, and this has pissed people off. A vote for Chase Oliver is a vote for Ross Ulbricht to die in prison. And the people lose their minds. And it's like, I'm sorry if you have not viewed what, has gone on with the Democrats and how they literally pulled a coup over a sitting president. If you have not witnessed what they did to Trump, if you have not witnessed what they did to RFK, if you have been living under a rock the past 20 years and you don't think after 2016, which love or hate Gary Johnson and Bill Weld was probably the last attempt to have a third party movement to fight the deep state. Do you, do you people genuinely think that by voting for Chase Oliver and potentially not put her in the White House, keep her in the White House because she is the de facto president. And it's not even really her. It's all of Obama's former alumni and staff and campaign and administration veterans. If you want to vote for and keep and maintain the authoritative state and damn yourselves and your children, go vote libertarian. Because Donald Trump is the only thing stopping all of that getting to you right now. So I want to take a step back and I just want to make sure folks understand the context of everything we're talking about today. So back in 2022, 21, 22, I moved here already. Um, Chase Oliver was on the show. I had Chase in the show and, uh, you know, I, I, I pushed him to ask him who he thinks our ideal voter is, um, what ideal or what main issues we as libertarians need to lead with. And, and folks, go listen to the episode. Uh, it was a very cordial conversation. I disagree with Chase vehemently, um, but his his opinion was we need to go after young folks, which I do agree with, by the way, but leading with climate change, leading with social issues. And it just hits me that there is a Fun, and I think we, we, we've realized this, Ramzo, we just, as a, a movement have never acknowledged the, the elephant in the room, is that libertarians are not just split on libertarianism. It's the culture of Americanism that also needs to go in line with the, the libertarianism. There's a lot of folks in the libertarian movement who are intoxicated with the idea, the ism of libertarianism. But what happens is when you are fixated on the idea, when you are fixated on the ism without any guiding like values or morals or North Star, then you're just constantly in pursuit of perfection in the ism. Whereas what we need to, and I think this is where the split comes in libertarian uh, party circles, is that there is a, a, a demand slash a need for American, Americanized libertarianism. 
where it is libertarian values and principles in, in tandem with an understanding of Americanism, the values that make America, America, the, 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 the principles that we stood for back in 1776, that, that ethic, that ethos of 1776 coupled with libertarianism is I think where we will win. I see, and I, I see that's where the libertarian party, it feels really has this split because if you're always in pursuit of the social issues, if you're always in pursuit of what makes you feel good, right? Then you're never in pursuit of something greater. If, if you're looking at winning as I can go out and wear, you know, a, a rainbow colored shirt and shout my sexuality to a group of four-year-olds. I don't think that's a win. I think actually it's a very cultural lose. Um, whereas if we were to, again, reframe it to an American idea of libertarianism, that would be, yeah, you can do that, but I'm going to vocally and vehemently say, don't you dare do it in front of four-year-olds. And as a matter of fact, I will fight you on that. Um, you are not to do that in front of my child. Who, who do you think you are? And and shame on parents who bring their kids to areas where this culture is seeping into what made America, America. So I, I say this, Remzo, the split in libertarians is not so much of who is more libertarian than the other, but who understands that libertarianism itself will not succeed unless you have some guiding moral cultural value that you are in pursuit of with libertarianism as the means to a, a, a achieve it and obtain that. I'll get off my soapbox now. I, I have I have a story, and I I think I, I think this is going to be a first time I actually talk about it, Brian. So you, you get it here. All um, right. I never used to think it was that big of a deal, but apparently it was. When I was at the Washington Times, um, you know, I was head of social media, but I was also I was a social media coordinator, and I was also head of outreach to try and work on influencers and try and bring in people to you know, be in within and share watch times content. Cause I believed at the time we were putting out the best content in uh news and journalism. And, uh, you know, that was a different era, but, um, you know, one of the groups that became probably my closest allies on Twitter was the log cabin Republicans. Hmm. And it was the log cabin Republicans nationally between 2019, 2020. It was a lot of state affiliate, uh, groups for the log cabin Republicans. And we didn't just coordinate the stuff that mattered to, you know, the LGBTQ community. They wanted stuff on taxes because they had an opinion on taxes, which was the conservative opinion. They want to talk about guns, which wasn't the gay opinion on guns. It was the conservative opinion on guns. The log cabin Republicans fought for decades to be seen as relevant because how they were viewed in the old GOP, which I'm glad is mostly dead at this point, refused to even acknowledge that they could be gay and they could be conservative. Yep. And they had fought for many years to not just be seen as that, but to give a voice to those who are willing to see them as people. And the log cabin Republicans, when I needed to boost numbers, when I needed to get a piece out, when I needed a statement or something, they were the first people for almost the, the year and a half I was there before I went on to work at Parlor, who I could rely on for that. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about them is that largely they have pushed the GOP, but also the political movement that targets people like them in a position of take it out of the arena as a political issue. You look at the abortion thing and why do Lila Rose and all of these pro-life organizations, which I have said for years are money laundering schemes Ooh. to keep people employed, to, to shoot down heartbeat bills, Susan B. Anthony's list and others. Why are they advocating? Because at the time there was stuff where they were saying like the heartbeat bills and stuff were too extreme. Suddenly they're going after Trump because he's just saying, I don't want this to be a political issue anymore. It became a, how do we keep our jobs by keeping the fight ongoing instead of seeking victory? The purpose of a, of a political advocacy nonprofit, the end goal should be to eliminate itself yep. because you succeeded. Yep. The log cabin Republicans are no longer really like this group that's trying to push for that. They're in your local committees. They're RNC rep delegates. They're running for office. They're actually like focusing on things because people have gotten to the point where it's like, it's no longer a political issue. Are we creating an environment where we could be free to choose the course of the direction of our lives or not? 
And they're the ones who have gone out and said the drag queen thing is ridiculous. Yep. The trans issue thing is ridiculous. Meanwhile, the libertarians are just like, well, if you don't vote for Chase Oliver, you're a bigot. It's like, how are you any different than the Democrats? You're not. They're not. They're not. And by the way, um, the culture is changing across the board. Not, not, I mean, libertarians where the autism will not, uh, unfortunately, let libertarians acknowledge when they are right or wrong. Uh, they'll just fight. But I'm seeing it in the normies. Uh, I, I called this out back in my last episode with the Brian's briefing, the disaffected normies of which I will. And, and just, you know, for, for the conversation today, I'm going to highlight one person in particular is very near and dear to me, my wife, um, who we are watching in one of our, our favorite shows to watch. Uh, and by the way, I don't watch like TV anymore. I, I canceled my Xfinity subscription and now I only have NFL Sunday ticket to watch football. Um, but beyond that, we watch YouTube. That YouTube is our, our platform to watch shows. So we watch Literally, our, our favorite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the number one show we watch is uh, Good Mythical Morning with Rhett and Link. Love that show. We watch it every night and it's definitely left of center. Like the, the culture on the, the, the show. I mean, they're based in fucking SoCal, right? So like they're, they're lefties through and through. But the, I noticed something that was very interesting and I hope my wife's listening. Cause she, she pointed this out the other night we're watching the show and they have this, like, um, it was five different generate bro sectomies. What's that? They, they got vasectomies together. They did. They got bro sectomies and they got, um, what's the one up the butt, uh, colonoscopies. They got that, uh, yeah, broanoscopies, they called it. I'm not going to um, say it again, but okay. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're going to get in trouble. Um, I'm but anyway, enough. So they did this um, special where they had, it was like, which generation is the funniest? They had Gen Alpha, Gen Z, Gen uh, Millennial, Gen X, and then Boomers. So each one had a, a person representing the generation, and then they would give them a topic, and they would do a stand-up comedy bit for like you know, 30 seconds on that topic. And the Gen Zer was this sassy gay guy. And there was a moment, like it was probably three or four cycles through on the jokes, and every time his jokes always went back to something about him being a sassy gay guy. And there was a moment my wife just kind of went, <sighs> and I turned and I was like, what? She goes, he's not funny. And I was like, why? Why isn't he funny? Now, mind you, my wife is completely agnostic usually to the political process. Like she's just, she's my North star to what your average person thinks because she just, she doesn't, Attention, freedom fighters. Liberty Tonight is storming the airwaves this week, October 17th from 9 to 11 p.m. Central. Brian Piotr and the King Libertarian are hosting a live podcast extravaganza that will make you laugh harder than at government efficiency. Mystery guests, Madcap Mayhem, and more. It's time to party like it's 1776. Don't let tyranny win. Tune in to the number four libertynetwork.com and let liberty light up your night one more time. The number four libertynetwork.com. And now back to the show. And I turned and I was like, what? She goes, he's not funny. And I was like, why? Why isn't he funny? Now, mind you, my wife is completely agnostic usually to the political process. Like she's just, she's my North star to what your average person thinks because she just, she doesn't read this every day like we do. She doesn't watch the videos or listen to the podcasts. So I, I just want to see where she's at. And she's like, well, everything just goes back to him being gay. And like every joke is is like around that. Like, And it's not funny. Like he, he's trying to force the joke based on his gayness. And it just, it was, it was completely unappealing. And I just kind of sat back and I, I smiled a little bit because I realized that this this force feeding culturally of uh, it, it's the the joke I had one of my SDRs back in the day um at my old company and he used to make the joke about like look Brian there's an advertisement I found with two white people in it not a, a husband and wife that are mixed race because think about from like what the mid 2010s to just a short I mean even today they're still doing it where you never see an advertisement where it's two white couples ever and this this force feeding of this cultural. DEI mentality. And, and you know what? I know we, we said the, the, the energy. I think it's the DEI energy, Remzo. That is exactly what we, we should wrap up. It is, Brian. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble anymore. Um, no, no, but like this is exactly what it ties up with the bow, right? It is this DEI mentality 
And this is where I think, you know, we, we are seeing the cultural spit split from your average person too. They are tired of it. They're tired of the insanity. They're tired of it being just like force fed. People want jokes to be funny because they're jokes. I mean, the Michael Scott quote, right? There's no such thing as an offensive joke. That's why it's a joke. And that's why we're seeing shows like Kill Tony. You're seeing stand up comedians like Shane Gillis and, and Andrew Schultz. Like they're having success. Why? Why are these guys who are so against this DEI perspective? How and why are they having success? Oh, because the market is demanding it. The market is saying, give us normality again, please. I think my favorite stand-up special in recent memory was from four years ago. It was the Dave Chappelle uh, skit when he came back to Netflix. And he's, it's the one where he's in the jumpsuit and he's talking yep. about living in like Wyoming or wherever the hell he's in. And he got in trouble because of the alphabet people jokes. But like, I, I feel like, you know, cold, cold humor and everything died with three, with three things, the office, Tropic Thunder and the hangover. Hmm. I think those are the last vestiges of true comedy, which was true honesty, because if you can't talk about things openly and call things for what they are, even when it's mean, um, that that's where it goes down. And I mean, I, I say this with the best of intentions, but like the libertarian party is the least happy thing ever uh, no matter what they say no matter how they've tried to market themselves and i saw that chase oliver recently ripped off the rand paul a uh, tax code chainsaw thing yep it's like notice how it's the people who are talking about how happy and how awesome how cool they are who are the most miserable people the campaign of joy is miserable the <laughs> campaign of you know freedom and liberty and all this stuff is miserable because they all know they're living a lie at the end of the day Whereas for once, and this is why I call it the old GOP versus the new GOP, the new GOP ain't perfect, but the new GOP actually reflects a person like me, which is somebody that wants to pursue living in a diverse country. I will really, opinions, and this is where we're at. I'm trying to find the video. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I can't find the video. So for folks, just go go watch. It was Vince Vaughn on the YouTube show Hot Ones where they sit down and they eat the chicken wings and they progressively get hotter and hotter. There's a question that was asked to Vince Vaughn and it was about the decline in funny movies from Hollywood, specifically at the end of the 2010s. And, and you, you go back, I mean, think of the 2000s, Remzo, Super Troopers, 40-year-old virgin, super bad. I mean, beer wedding fat. crashers, beer fest, old school. I mean, all the Tropic Thunder, the I hangover. Old school with my wife, and I thought, oh, she's gonna hate this movie. She freaking loved old school. And and this right here, right? Dodgeball. Th this question, dodgeball. Yeah, two thousand and four, right? Like these movies, Step Brothers. I mean, you go go Talladega Nights. Um, all of these movies, right, from the the mid two thousands to like mid twenty tens, they were funny. They you you would laugh your ass. I remember sitting in the theater. Like 17 year old Brian crying my eyes out laughing at super bad, right? Like these movies were funny. And, and now we get to this point where it's like every movie just feels like kind of the same version of itself, but with a little, little different twist. And Vince Vaughn covers this in the, in the hot ones interview, but I'm going to paraphrase. And he, he outlines how there is this corporate mentality nowadays with, with movies in terms of when you're trying to create an idea for a movie you're looking for the safest, most like templatized version of that movie you can make. So the person who's like, listen, we followed the steps. This is how you make a $200 million movie at the box office, right? And, and he says this, he goes, nobody's getting fired for following that, that process, right? So it's not even so much of, hey, let's make a great movie and, and have it be funny, have it be its own thing. Like, there's no movie like Superbad. There's no movie like Tropic Thunder. They're their own movies. There's no movie like Step Brothers. And yet those movies don't exist. Any like nobody's trying to make those movies anymore, except the Daily Wire making Lady Ballers, right? Like that's the probably the closest thing we have to an actual I, funny I movie. I haven't watched a Will Ferrell movie in a while because the no. last Will Ferrell movie I saw in terms of like recent stuff, because I'll go back and like Blades of Glory is one of my <laughs> is one of my favorite Will Ferrell movies. Yeah. Um and then he did another one during the Jenna Fisher too. Whew. Yeah, there was another one in the and it called um uh it, it was where he was a he was an Icelandic singer. Eurovision. Eurovision, that's, that's right, with Rachel McAdams. I forgot about that yeah, one. That, that was so funny, but like he did um 
Holmes and Watson. Yep. Which was a horrible, which was just like a DEI political pander fest. Yep. And it's like he, Will Ferrell has also kind of gone into this. Cause like one, one of my favorite shows is, uh, is, is succession succession and succession actually has Will Ferrell as a co-producer and you see some of his humor in there, but like you, you definitely pick it up sometimes. And then he also did with, um, uh, McKay, uh, Adam McKay or Adam, whatever his name is, who did uh, the movie vice about Dick mm-hmm. Cheney. Uh, I think how they did the movie was good. I think that they go at, I think that they credit. Yeah. I think that they give uh, Dick Cheney credit for a lot of things. Dick Cheney, uh, did not deserve credit for he, They just wanted to really go after him, but like it stopped being funny, but it became like it became liberal comedy. Liberal comedy is not about laughter. I think it was Dave. It's Chappelle clapter. It's, it's laughter. clapter. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I agree. How brave! And by the way, I have a I have an unpopular opinion. I think Nikki Glaser is actually funny. She's funny, and I'll take her over Ken Jong. Remember the guy from The Hangover? Yeah, I saw. Oh, dude, I will tell you. And I, I did find the clip. I'm going to share this clip really, really fast. Uh, but one of the most disappointing stand-up comedy routines I've ever seen was Ken Jong on it was Netflix. Horrible, horrible. Well, He's like my doctor, wrong. or yeah, my my wife is a doctor the, the the clapping seals in the audience they're like ah, huh. he's like she is way better than me she's incredible it's like dude we get it like we know you gotta do the dei thing but really quick remzo i want to share this video i did find it here on um on the the youtube so just it's a 45 second clip this is vince vaughn talking about why r-rated comedies are on life support in hollywood or old school what if i got to go back and you know be in a fraternity now at, at this stage of the game the people in charge don't want to get fired more so than they're looking to do something great so they want to kind of you know follow a set of rules that somehow like it's set in stone that don't really translate but as long as they follow them they're not going to lose their job because they can say well look i i i i uh crunched the numbers yeah i made a i made a movie off the board game payday so you can't even though the movie didn't work you can't let me go right so um people want to laugh people people want to you look at stuff, at stuff that feels, that feels a little, little bit like it's, like it's you, know, you know dangerous or pushing the envelope, the envelope. and, and I, think I think you're going to see more of it in the film space, space uh, sooner, sooner than later. God, I hope he's right, Remzo. God, I hope he's right because the the culture needs it, we, and the culture's demanding it, man. Um, like whether it's going to be an organization like Daily Wire who's just kind of doing their own thing. I mean, what is a woman? Lady Ballers, Am I Racist, which actually surpassed Super Size Me from um, total grossing revenue for for uh, for documentaries. And it's the it top. It do better than Joker 2 at this point. It should do better than Joker 2. God, what an abomination. I didn't even watch the movie yet, but I just I watched some clips. What did they do? I want to I want to watch. I spoiled the movie for myself. I know exactly what happens, but I want to watch it just to kind of like, you know, just kind of like face face existence it's like i'm forced to watch so others don't have to <laughs> it's bird box it, um, they're gonna hold your eyes open like this and just but, but like you know and, and i agree with what you said about daily wire and stuff like that but like i want to get to the point where it's like none of the stuff has to have a political bent like why can't stuff be good just to be good yes and, um, and i here. think that's i think that's where a lot of conservatives lose me it's like i'm not gonna pay to watch subpar conservative comedy Right. Like it's just like the blaze tried doing that with some stuff. And it's like, you know, people and we don't like to admit it. But the truth is, is that we will support things purely because we just like the effort. So I'm actually uh, Angel Studios actually went ahead and did, um, you know, a a private equity round for accredited and unaccredited investors. And I actually bought um, uh, shares in Angel Studios. Why is that? Because of films like Sound of Freedom, because of Mm -hmm. films like. uh it was um oh shit it was with christopher palaha and uh, neil mcneil mcdonough it was um i I feel horrible it it was where it's basically like a twilight zone type film it came out like a year ago it was really Mm -hmm. really good and they've done other films too like they're doing bonhoeffer they're doing stuff that is obviously more towards uh, a christian audience but the shift that's what it was called neil mcdonough and christopher palaha did the shift which my wife and i saw in theaters and we're like this is a sci-fi film that's based off like biblical principles but it's like it's not like the kurt cameron christian movies that right. are on like tv it's like these are good multi-million dollar like action flicks and dramas and like they're genuinely good and it's like i will put my money towards that 
because one, yeah, it, it has a, it puts out a good message and aligns with more of me, but it's like, if they weren't doing, if they weren't making good movies, I would never invest in that. But, you know, I did that not only from a fiduciary standpoint of, I think it's a good investment as a customer. My thing is like, I will want to invest where I'm already spending my money. And it's like, it's just genuinely good. It's good for goodness sake. It's just good shit. Yes, preach. By the way, speaking of fiducias, uh, here's a tweet that went viral on my end. Uh, I just wanted to share this today. 1.6 million views. Uh, Bernie Sanders, if you held the right for health insurance, I'm asking you to fight for those who don't. Except I uh, shared this post that eliminates every time he says the word fight with the word pay uh, because, you know, that's actually more accurate. Uh, so ch if you're checking this out on um, on the, the, the video screens here, you'll see. Quite a few uh, engagement. 1.6 million <laughs> views. Thank you, Elon. Thank you for giving us a platform where I can point out the fiducia's uh, silliness. Uh, you said fiduciary, and just it instantly made me giggle because it, it has the word. I've been reading a lot. I've been it. reading a lot of like financial statements and stuff recently. And, and I'm a child, so. <laughs> yeah, good times. Remzo, we are over the hour. Um, so that bit, we're going to go ahead, start to, to wrap things up today. So yes, we have been live at our Cardio Miracle Studios here, part of the Week in Review uh, Amp America show. Every week, Remzo and I are going through the top two or three articles that have been going throughout the past week of news, giving our insights. Yes, talking about the DEI, dare I say, energy that has been coming up repeatedly on this conversation and i, I just want to put a, a little you know pin in that piece of conversation libertarians wake up um it's time to start like playing in the real world versus this make-believe world um i'm hoping that more and more folks are going to start to pay attention to um a different way of doing things we're seeing vivek Ramaswamy, jd vance like these are some of the folks now taking over uh, the Republican Party leadership, which even though I don't agree with J.D. Vance and a lot of like more of his nationalist perspectives, I know for a fact that he and Vivek Ramaswamy were like BFFs back in college. So I, I can you tell don't you want we're to trans your kids. No, and we can have at least a, a cordial conversation about where libertarianism and nationalism from a Republican standpoint will disagree. And this kind of goes back to the Jason Stapleton um, perspective, right? We are on this this school bus through space going towards libertopia. We got a quite a few stops between then and there, but we are in pursuit of this direction. So if anybody's on that bus that's in the same pursuit of that end destination, I'm on your team, right? And if you need to get off the bus a little bit before we get to Libertopia, because you're like, I don't want to go this far, that's fine. But at least be on the bus with us as we're going towards this destination. Don't don't go on the other bus, which is going to like wacky, waving, inflatable, arm filling tube land. Uh, so like, let's pay attention to real world where folks are actually going to have real conversations that are going to impact things for our society going forward in the best of ways. That's my final thoughts today, Remzo. Anything as we wrap things up? I think I've said enough, Brian. Uh, I think you have too. Don't worry. So as Remzo gets canceled, please go ahead and make sure you follow him on all social media platforms. Go Remzo over on Instagram. Hey Remzo over on Facebook as well as Twitter. Uh, Remzo's links will all be in the show notes. If you want to go ahead and give him some love or give him a, a piece of your mind, email him or message him again. Hey Remzo and go Remzo. You can find yours truly at B. Nichols Liberty, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as over on YouTube and on Rumble. We are airing the show live today on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so if you joined us today, we had a couple hundred folks popping in and out of the live stream this Saturday morning. Thank you. Uh, and make sure you hit that subscribe button so you miss a single time we go live. Other than that, Remzo, I think we're going to wrap things up for our Amp America Week in Review. Great talking to you, buddy. Have a, a great weekend, and uh, we'll reconvene next week. You too, Brian. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.